So hello, I'm Greg Favalora. Uh, I'd like to thank the rest of the conference committee for permitting me and uh, to, to report on my coworkers' efforts towards electro-holographic light field projector modules. You'll be learning today about surface acoustic wave AOMs, illumination and packaging. I'd like to thank, uh, it's a very, very large team. So uh, the so-called task leads involved are Michael Mobius, Valerie Bloomfield, John LeBlanc, and Sean O'Connor. We all work at a company in Cambridge, Massachusetts, called Draper, and the reason there's an Apollo logo is to commemorate uh, our involvement in the Apollo missions to the moon 50 years ago. So this is a talk uh, bringing us towards solid state and scalable AOM-based holographic video. And by scalable, I mean we wish there were technologies that would allow you to make an electronic hologram that was as small as a mobile phone, as large as a desktop device, or even larger the size of a wall-mounted display. Um, this type of technology, it's an AOM that has uh, shown promise at places like the MIT Media Lab and also at Brigham Young University in groups run uh, by Daniel Smalley or Michael Bove or other places around the world. Um, but it does not conclude with the display. Um, it's a discussion of three elements of an upcoming prototype display, and also due to time constraints, I assume that a uh, reasonable enough proportion of the audience already knows about holographic stereograms and uh, parallax panoramograms. I'd like to thank um, as many of the contributors as I can in this from a whole variety of technical threads from custom modulator development to interconnects to microfab and fiber optics, uh, including our collaborator, Dan Smalley, and his students at BYU, although the material of our collaboration is outside the scope of today's talk. So in my opinion, and evidently the opinion of the previous speaker or two, is that we 3D display engineers really need next generation spatial light modulators, and that's because auto stereoscopic displays really consume pixel bandwidth in a whole variety of ways. And if you wanna make truly diffractive holographic video, not snake oil where everything is called a hologram, we certainly need new SLMs. So as a basis for my argument, um, let's posit what some desirable features are of a good 3D display. It probably needs to be solid state, that is lacking mechanical scanners, it should be modular. It needs a useful field of view, right? 30 degrees, 45 degrees, um, but also to provide good image depth, you need many rays per degree, and furthermore, each of those rays has to have a very low divergence. You want to provide the customer with a high resolution at the display surface so that ideally every emitter would project a multitude of views rather than relying on lenticulars to uh, spatially multiplex those views. And if it's holographic, it provides you sort of analog methods by which you could shape the wavefronts of light. So um, quickly, we um, canvassed the world of commercially um, available spatial light modulators and plotted them in terms of their seam-free modulator area. That is, how big could you likely make them if you didn't want the user to see any frames? And you could see it's logarithmic from millimeter squared to centimeter squared to meter squared, um, and map that against the equivalent grading frequency they need to give you a certain field of view. And most of them are excellent technologies, but they're either too small or don't have a wide enough viewing angle. So this work today is reporting on our efforts to extend some academically inspired work uh, and increase it in terms of area and field of view. Uh, we, I apologize because we had a few minute delay getting started, so I'm gonna hurry through this other than to say the teams are working on quite a few of the core technologies uh, and we're choosing targets for those technologies. At first, we're going to be building an edge-emitting array of cards that I will describe in this talk. Uh, also, we are studying ways in which we could just have a single flat or flat-ish unit similar to a uh, tablet display so that the user only sees one um, uh, sheet or wafer, if you will. But most of this talk will be about the device above because it's, a necessary, it's useful and also it's a necessary stepping stone to the device on the bottom. There's quite a bit of related work in the field of electroholography generally. A lot of that came out of the pioneering lab of uh, the late Stephen Benton, who was a conference chair of the conference you're attending today. Uh, and also, a subset of that is how you use not bulk acoustic optical modulators, but rather surface acoustic wave devices. So the previous speaker, Professor Onyrol, wrote a paper back in 94 proposing the use of these interesting AOMs. And later on, Dan Smalley and Quinn Smithwick and other folks have been developing it towards holographic display. So most of these presentations today will be on YouTube, and that's your opportunity to sort of uh, pause and look at some of these references. Here's how we want to build a 3D display. The concept is the sketch on the left in which there is a chassis of vertically stacked cards that we call light field projection modules, or LFPMs. They are composed into pixels, or hogels, uh, in the parlance. Each hogel projects not one perspective, nor does it necessarily scan. It can project 10, 80, or 200 
uh, perspectives at once. They each receive illumination from a fiber optic bundle as well as electrical signals from drive cables. Uh, and we're proceeding in that direction. So today we're finishing up qualification of all of the underlying technologies you'd need to put this together. So let's dive in. Uh, over the last two years, we be, to, to give you a sense of progress, about two years ago, everything we did was roughly meter scale. Then in May, we shrunk it down to centimeter scale, which was quite uh, a feat. And now we're down to millimeter scale. So uh, the only way pedagogically I could think of to show this to you all is to quickly show you pictures of these things and say, wait, wait, now I'll tell you how we got it down to a millimeter scale. At its heart is this unusual holographic modulator that you will learn about in a moment. That is bonded to a circuit board so it could receive its drive signals. And light is coupled into the modulator's optical waveguides through a centimeter scale prism, uh, illuminated to within 0.1 degree precision uh, by a fiber optic array that gets its light from a, a laser split by four, as well as several um, arbitrary waveform generators. We did some beam expansions, I'm sorry, some uh, field of view and angle expansions. We could see the output where you place a polarizer and a diffuser. Now, every single uh, Hogel can emit light in any number of directions that you would want, and we did as a first demo a series of moving dots that were left and right uh, that we intercepted with this uh, test surface. So in this photograph here, you can see optical fibers coming up, which carry the laser illumination, uh, which are split by four into a fiber optic tray through the custom modulator and so on. Okay, so now I've sort of given you the big picture, which is that electroholography exists. Unfortunately, we're not finding in catalogs the light modulators you'd need to produce large-scale or tileable 3D, and so we're using a type of newish, uh, for this field, modulator called the surface acoustic wave modulator. The current generation is boiled down to millimeter scale. Our motivation, as I said at first, is to build an edge-emitting holographic display. Its requirements is that we would like to build about 25 of these vertical modules, maybe 20, maybe 30, with about eight pixels per column on a two millimeter pitch. The display will have a horizontal field of view of 30 to 45 degrees, and we had to satisfy some really critical mechanical requirements. In order to fit within two millimeters, we worked out that the device has to be less than 1.8 millimeters thick and contain the uh, circuit board and the modulator itself, as well as the connectors. So this light field projector module that we hope will enable a new generation of holographic display has three core components. The first is a so-called multi-channel or multi-hogal saw AO modulator. This is made out of X-cut Y-propagating lithium niobate, which is a piezoelectric crystal that's in common use, uh, a fiber optic illumination array that delivers light into the system, and a co-designed circuit board. So let's get into the first of these three things, uh, the saw modulators, and their job is to generate these amplitude modulated horizontal fans of light per emitter without scanning. So this is a saw modulator. Saw modulators have been around since the 1970s. Uh, principally, they're used in telecom. Uh, and this is in an edge emitting architecture, meaning light comes in from one edge and light exits the opposite edge. There is a substrate made out of this piezoelectric crystal, lithium niobate, uh, into which are patterned waveguides. These are regions just below the surface with a slightly different index of refraction, such that when input light that we TE polarize is put into it, it's trapped into the waveguide. But meanwhile, uh, we had patterned IDTs on it uh, in chrome gold, which are tiny little electrodes, such that if you put an oscillating field on it, like 300 megahertz, 400 megahertz, literal ripples, these surface acoustic waves, are induced and traverse the surface of this chip at about 3,600 meters per second. By changing the frequency components into those IDTs, you can induce different diffraction patterns. That is the literal hologram, which when the TE polarized light interacts with it, dips into the plane of the display that you're looking at and exits out uh, of the device. So let's go through that one more time. Here's a cross-sectional view of a saw modulator in which an IDT is pictured in the upper right. Uh, this is chirped, so it has a nice broad frequency response. The minimum feature size is in the realm of two microns or so, uh, and we design it to be uh, happy working between 250 and 400 megahertz. As a function of the frequency components that we put into it, you can predict the angle that light will come out for each of those frequency components uh, using the following relation. And then when it pops out into air, you simply use Snell's law to figure out what the angle is in air. But the short story is for this particular type of modulator, as you increase the drive frequency, that theta air decreases and vice versa. But the fabulous fact about these things is that each emitter can reconstruct a luminance modulated fan of light in angle without requiring scanning. 
That is, I've shown this ostensible um, frequency spectrum of the drive signal versus the power that you're giving it, right? So you feed it some complicated summation of sine waves, which represents the brightness per pixel for every single perspective that a user might view it at. And then the modulator does the job of simply allowing the photons to exit at those angles that you've programmed in. And there are a variety of references that'll help bring folks up to speed on how this technology works. So once we built this saw modulator, we also have a semi-automated characterization apparatus in which we place new pixel chips into it. Uh, under lab view control, assert a variety of RF frequencies, and a sensor on a rotary stage takes a look. So we step it to a first angle, ramp the frequency, move the sensor a little bit, ramp the frequency, and so on and so forth. And if working properly, uh, the system should generate a plot uh, as shown. And indeed it does. So this really made our day when these chips started working a couple years ago. These are plots of saw frequency, or the uh, applied RF frequency on the x-axis, and the y-axis is the theta relative to an arbitrary laboratory frame of the light that exits these modulators prior to any sort of field of view expansion. So for example, the unit on the right just natively uh, was a roughly 18 degree field of view. Uh, we also have bright ones. By driving these things at just about 10 milliwatts or so per pixel, uh, we get microwatt per millimeter squared regime light coming out of the system, which means it's bright enough to see and we're happy with it. Okay, so I've explained that saw modulators are part of these light field projection modules. I want to make a quick sidebar about depth reconstruction, which is a topic that sometimes comes up at this conference, but folks rarely go into a lot of depth so to speak, about. So the resolution to a user with depth depends on several things. The spacing between your emitters, the density of the views, but also, to be fair, the divergence of each view. It's meaningless to have 50 views if they're spreading apart really widely in angle space. Uh, I'm running out of time to really go into depth on this and the next slide, but here's the big picture, and these are some great references you can read if you're interested in learning more. Essentially, if a display pictured at bottom uh, is being viewed by a viewer shown up at top, um, near the screen, the resolution in these uh, holographic stereograms and multi-view displays is limited, by the, is limited by the pixel density, right? It's not gonna get sharper than the density of your pixels, but as you go farther from the screen, the resolution is limited by the divergence of each view and also the number of views. And the same kind of thing happens behind the screen. And you've probably seen this in holograms, right? They're sharpest at the hologram plane, but gradually get blurry in both directions in depth. So the name of the game is as many views as you can get and have those views not be very divergent. So the lovely thing, we're gonna skip the left-hand side of this slide, which is some calculations that are published in numerous places. Uh, the lovely thing about surface acoustic wave AOMs is that you can get a very high number of separable views, and they depend on very few, very easy to achieve things. The RF bandwidth driving the device, the length of the region in which the wave-guided light interacts with the surface acoustic wave, and also the speed of that surface acoustic wave. So for example, um, you can get 83 views out of a single pixel simultaneously using those sample values above, or close to 300 if the interaction length is a centimeter instead of uh, several millimeters or so. And so, for example, one of the very first chips that we made, uh, we observed 64 separable views coming out with a full uh, array, full angle divergence of less than a tenth of a degree. All right, so moving on quickly to the second aspect of these tileable modules is the fiber optic illumination array. It is important in these systems to launch light into the waveguides at exactly the correct angle to within roughly 0.1 degrees of some reference axis. So we made some very shallow trays to hold fiber optic arrays in, and we eliminated that large centimeter scale incoupling prism uh, by taking a trick from telecom, which is to etch gratings into the surface of the AOM. Uh, this is a photograph that I'm very proud of. The folks in the Draper machine shop managed to machine these tiny trays. The minimum feature size here is 250 microns from a machine shop, into which we put uh, fibers into ferrules uh, with green lot rod lenses, all aimed to be within the reference size that we need. And that let the team shrink the thickness down from 11 millimeter pitch down to two millimeter pitch. Uh, and this worked as well. So we chose to drive this at one frequency at a time just so we could observe a moving dot. Uh, so fiber optic light came in through the incoupling gratings and lit up a live saw modulator and we could see the path of the steered output light. 
Finally, as you can imagine, it's critical that uh, these all fit into the chassis and that the chips be bonded to their circuit boards with no chance of them popping off, as simple as that might sound. So again, the fibers and the pixels and their circuit boards had to occupy 1.8 millimeters in space. But uh, if you recall from the other slides, the, the business end, the same face of these saw modulators contains the solder pads and the surface acoustic waves. So you can't just push this flip chip bonded chip up against the circuit board because there's no air gap then for those surface waves to even propagate. And it can't be really, really far away because conductive epoxy can't reach that far. So what did we do? Uh, the team developed a technique that takes advantage of the fact that circuit boards have multiple layers and that the layers of a circuit board live at multiple elevations above some ground level. So if you take a look here at the circuit board of the LFPM, the pixel, uh, the modulator chip sits here, and we took a cut in a profilometer in the metrology lab through this axis. You can see the elevation of the uh, silk screen layer, which are those white lines that the human operator sees. There's a solder mask standoff, and then at the bottom is the copper layer that's five or 10 microns away. So the trick is to use the solder mask as the porch or the ledge on which you could sit these modulator chips giving enough of an air gap for the induced surface acoustic waves on this piezoelectric crystal, while providing enough closeness for silver epoxy to be bonded and receive the signals in the first place that drive the chip. So um, the end-to-end -end electrical continuity of that third uh, element also passed, which retired significant risk from the program. We were able to uh, use very thin electrical connectors, which are millimeter scale, went through the entire chain from the RF modulator to these thin cables to the modulator chips, and that all worked uh, quite well. So I appreciate letting me talk this quickly. I'd like to wrap up in uh, one last slide. The next step is to assemble displays. So at first, now that I've expressed that we're developing custom acoustro-optical modulators, custom very tiny fiber arrays, custom in-coupling and flip chip bonding methods, it's time to finish qualifying all of these, and then we go ahead and replicate 20 or 25 or 30 of these during this calendar year to demonstrate a new moving parts three-dimensional display. And also, we're doing some uh, uh, very early explorations in a vast simplification of this for applications of different scale factors, such as emitting from the system's broad face. Uh, organizations like MIT and BYU have uh, published or alluded to things like this, and we are also working this space just a bit. The interesting thing is here is those saws, these programmable holograms, propagate many millimeters before they die out. The analogy you could think of is going to a bed sheet and rippling it in a very complex way. It flies along at 3,600 meters per second, and when that hologram is in the position you need, you strobe it with a laser, and then a light field emerges from the system. But that is out of the scope of this presentation. So thank you very much for your time. Is anybody?